I'm, I'm very pleased to have uh, Søren Brunak here today from Copenhagen. Søren uh, initially studied physics and then already did his PhD in computational biology quite early on. He has been one of the leading figures in bioinformatics in Europe for, for many, many years. Um, he founded the Copenhagen uh, uh, and Copenhagen is CBS, the Center for Biological Sequence Analysis, later on also the Novo Nordisk Center for Protein Research. Uh, he's now at uh, Copenhagen University and also associated with the University Hospital. And he has been instrumental in, in many of the uh, uh, key developments in bioinformatics, but also in infrastructures in Europe, uh, not the least of all, of course, Elixir, from which you probably all know him as well. He is also a fellow of the International Society for Computation Biology, among many other awards. And I'm very pleased to have him here today to tell us a few things about the developments in Denmark, um, so we can compare notes and see uh, how we could have done things. Søren, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Oliver, for, um, uh, for this uh, generous uh, introduction and also for the invitation. I mean, this is really, as we already heard, an area where we need to learn from each other. I don't think there is a one size fits all model for for infrastructure at this stage. I think it's more like precision infrastructure in each uh, country. If that would work, I think it would be a big achievement. There might be initiatives like the European Health Data Space or other initiatives that might make things con converge, but I think we need to adapt to the legal and the sort of silo, uh, siloed situation in, 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 in different countries. So, so um, I talked a little bit with, with Oliver about this talk and, and um, I think the, the sort of notion for what I wanna say is that uh, genomes are really not uh, self-explanatory. I mean, we need, we need to link them to something in order to interpret them. So we need healthcare data, we might also need socioeconomic data, we might need a lot of our data and we might need to go back to the patient and back to the data, molecular data in order to interpret the, the, the genome. So, so uh, the problem in all countries is of course that these data are in many different uh, silos and behind different types of, of uh, barriers. And I will tell you a little bit about how this looks in, in, in Denmark. And I know it cannot just be trans, uh, transferred, but, but this is linkability that I would like to, to, uh, to, 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 to stress here in the Danish context. I mean, just a, a few remarks on, on where we, uh, how we got into establishing a national infrastructure for precision medicine. We had like in many other countries, sort of a phase where we had white papers and I, uh, co-authored um, uh, one of them and eventually what happened in Denmark was that we got a law that the Danish queen signed uh, and you see up here that that this was in um, in 2018 that the parliament um, uh, accepted uh, this um, this law and and um, and this law um, says various things uh, I mean we have a lot of health data agencies in Denmark who deal with health data, for example, but here it was decided to make a new agency, state agency for genome data. And, um, and that's of course a problem in many countries that the genomes are all over the place, in, in hospitals, in regions, at many different levels. But, but here the law says there should be one national genome database. If you run a hospital, it's forbidden that you keep the genomes to yourself. You need to um, uh, upload them and deposit them in the national infrastructure so that clinicians can go back into them and so that they also can be used for, for research because that is also what, what the law says. So there's an opt-out model. Of course, you can, you can um, say you don't wanna be sequenced if the clinician offers you whole genome sequencing. Um, you can actually also opt out of having the data used for research, uh, but very few people uh, do that. So there are other things here 
uh, that that data from, for example, research projects can also get into the infrastructure, but we haven't really started doing that um, in in any massive way. Police no access here except if it's terrorism. So so that sort of sets a frame for for sort of one central repository for for these data, and that's very much in line. I mean, with how we deal with data in 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 Denmark, we make national registries, of course, also easier in a small country. So this national uh, genome center was. Um, it's a, it's a bad name, in my um, uh, opinion, because it is a state agency and it sounds like a research center or something like that. But the the containers uh, were were put in a secure private cloud infrastructure that can host that, and of course also linked to sequencing centers that the national genome center uh, is um, 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 is running. So, what makes linkability? Uh, easier, at least more feasible in in in, uh, in Denmark than in many other places, and I think it's similar in some other countries, the other Nordic countries, uh, Scotland. Uh, there are also other examples elsewhere outside Europe and so on. But we got our social security number in 1968, and that meant that everybody alive at that time uh, they got a number. So that meant that most of the people who were born in the 1900s and also some from the late 1800s, they got a number. And there's actually now a, a project trying to give everybody who lived in Denmark for the past 200 years a social security number to try to link what is on, on, on in graveyards, what is in church books and, and all that stuff. And I think there are similar um, projects um, uh, elsewhere. But this means that, that it is... Uh, provided, of course, you have a permission, it, it's not very difficult to go across registries uh, in Denmark. Uh, and here I just show you one example. If you have patient record data up here, uh, and this is a data set I have with millions of patient records, I can, I can uh, link it to a diabetes registry or the national prescription registry that contains around 1.3 billion prescriptions from the last um, uh, 25 years or so, a little little bit over there. We also have the national patient registries. And then we also have a lot of biobanks. For example, the Danish blood donor study that I'm involved in running the infrastructure for. And there's also something called the Copenhagen Hospital Biobank here. But the Genome Center is sort of put into this kind of e ecosystems where a system where things can be, be, uh, be linked. Uh, but in Denmark, you 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 need an, an ethical uh, approval if you would like to run a research project that involves um, uh, genetic data. So, so of course, you need a permission to to link the, these data. But in principle, uh, I think the whole digital infrastructure in the health data domain was sort of uh, in place. And I think also if you go to healthcare, when I look at it after Corona. Very, very little change was made to the digital health data infrastructure in relation to patients due to Corona. It was the same web pages you went and, and, and looked up your test, where you go and look for your lab values when you get back from the doctor and so on. Of course, some small watches where it took a little bit longer to log in, but it was the same infrastructure. Uh, because it's 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 sort of infrastructure um, extensively um, um, already. So if you run another project, you might want to use cancer registries that actually goes back to 1943. Uh, but here I have a, a project where I look at all school old school health records, for example, back to the 30s, and I can link part of that also. So in principle, this number makes these things. Uh, possible and of course for the for the genomes there is no a extra hassle except getting approval for it. Um, and now some of these registries also are turning real time. For example, the, the national patient registry is now it's not released in real time yet, but it is structured as a real time registry where the diagnosis and the procedures and 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 all that the prescriptions are getting in. Um, uh, actually, not the prescriptions, but but the diagnosis and 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 the procedures and so on from the hospitals are getting in in real time. That's of course also something we learned from Corona, that running a um, a static registry where you have to wait half a year for for the data 
will not help you in a, in a pandemic situation. But this was planned long before the pandemic to go real time with, 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 with that particular registry. And I think that's also an, an important uh, discussion uh, uh, here. And of course, also data on, on healthy individuals. Here's a slide from, from uh, our uh, blood donor study where we have a lot of data on people from before they get sick and then eventually they have to retire as blood donors. Um, uh, and, and, and this organization called Statistics Denmark, it runs 400 different databases and registries that can be linked in uh, also. So really a rich, ecosystem with a lot of different data that can be used to interpret genomes in various uh, uh, various ways. So I just skip this one. But what the National Genome Center has done in Denmark is essentially to create a cloud um, where they have their data and there's also some, some knowledge databases that travels um, with this uh, cloud. But then you see it's sort of embedded in, in, in this ecosystem where we have Statistics Denmark, we have the Danish uh, uh, National Health Data Authority that runs the National Patient Registry, the Prescription Registry, and, and so on and so forth. We have regions with patient records. We have all these biobanks and, and, and also international collaboration. So this is how they have sort of gone from, um, from this initial stage into uh, beginning to release uh, genome data that then can be uh, integrated with other other data types um, and and here's just uh, some of the the um, requirements you need to fulfill in order to get a a, a, um, um, a cloud um, of your own or a, a sort of a working space in that infrastructure but I should maybe go back and say, that these organizations, for example, here, yeah, they run also their own research service uh, offerings uh, already. Uh, so, so what they are doing in the National Genome Center here is actually just to sort of uh, mimic what, what, what you can uh, act already do, uh, uh, sometimes in a quite old fashioned way without a huge GPU cluster or something like that. So it limits what you actually can do. But I will return to that a little bit. Uh, but 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 this is the nice um, sort of situation here that there has been some expertise built up. Uh, Denmark was certainly not first mover like the UK and Estonia and so on in this domain. But now it seems to sort of get there at least infrastructure-wise in a way that uh, that is not uh, completely uh, uh, crazy. So in order to get into this infrastructure, you need, you need with personal medicine, but I think almost all medicine these days fulfill uh, that. Um, and uh, societal interest, uh, interest and, and, and so on. And, and companies can also enter into um, uh, at least collaborations around the data. So uh, as it is now, the companies have to team up with an academic institution and then make a joint uh, project. Um, so um, there's also from the National Genome Center a lot of, of, of international collaboration. For example, they are the representative with GDI and also Genome of Europe and so on. And, and, and there are collaboration agreements with some of you here in, in, in the room where, where we as a small country, of course, also need to hook into uh, rare disease data from other countries and all the usual arguments for, for making uh, collaboration. So this is the timeline. We started there in 2015 with these white papers, and now we are uh, here where we sort of have um, a, a national infrastructure that hasn't really been been, been used uh, heavily a lot, and I will also tell, tell you why. Uh, and now the um, uh, strategy for uh, national uh, for, for personalized medicine is running out and we are going to get a new one uh, going uh, forward. So it also helped that the Novo Nordic Foundation did put around 150 million euro into this, essentially making it free for the clinicians and the hospitals to offer whole genome sequencing to the patient. But um, uh, I will return to, 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 to this question on this slide because one um, disappointment in some sense is that 
the clinicians actually prescribed less whole genome sequencing that, uh, than uh, what many people had uh, expected. And so right now we have uh, 7,500 or close to 20,000 whole, whole um, genomes um, in, in the database. So it's not a whole lot, but now it has sort of taken off. But it is, of course, um, a huge burden for many clinicians to, to, um, uh, to uh, prescribe the genome sequencing and then get it interpreted and, 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 and so on. And I think that problem is all over the, the world. So here in a situation where it actually didn't cost hospitals anything, uh, at least in extra ex expense to sequence the, the genome, uh, the, the level was quite low. And, and that's, of course, a limiting factor. But uh, we have genotyped roughly 15% of the population in, 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 um, in Denmark. So we also have these uh, data. But, um, but in terms of whole genome sequencing, we are definitely be, uh, be, uh, behind. So more um, persuasion to the clinician uh, need to, to be put into to, uh, to, uh, to this. So this is a slide from May. Oops. Um, I, I go back again here. This is a, a um, slide from May. You see, we had three thousand extra. That's sort of the level. We we're, we're a small uh, country, so we are not expecting fifty thousand genomes per per month. But this has at least been um, been a, a disappointment uh, also for the for the researchers, and I, I think it also took off slower in many other many other countries. And I mean, one reason has also been that, that the disease areas where you could prescribe, they started out in a quite restrictive way. Of course, rare diseases you see here with the, with the children. Um, here, for example, many of them uh, are from, from, from that area. But the clinicians themselves, they had a long process where they actually prioritized um, uh, areas where they felt that it was most important to, to, to put the resources. But actually, I think they also underestimated themselves uh, how, how um, uh, hard it was to uh, persuade their colleagues to actually uh, sequence uh, uh, genome. Um, so, so, I mean, the Danish infrastructure uh, landscape here is of course super digital because it, it, it is one of the most digitized countries in in, um, in, um, in the world um, and you see Estonia here in Denmark and the UK uh, but but I mean we are maybe more ahead with infrastructure than 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 with data if we compare to est Estonia and and, uh, and, the, and the UK so that's the situation um, but but on the patient record side and, and, and all that, uh, we of course have been uh, highly digital for, for, for many years. So, so uh, in terms of linkage, as I said, it's uh, reasonably uh, easy, uh, but there are still barriers because we have these siloed organizations like Statistics Denmark and, and um, the Health Data Authority and the regions with the patient records, but I also will return to that um, in, 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 a, in a few slides. So, so um, that was some remarks about the opportunities in, in, in Denmark. And I uh, work in a lot of projects myself where, where uh, we try to, to link in genetic uh, data. For example, all the genotyping data. We made a disease trajectory browser with diagnosis. And, and, and that was based on data from 7.2 million people. And we would, of course, like to add in genetic data and risk factors from, from, uh, from these uh, resources would make a lot of, of, um, of, of, of sense. Um, uh, I have another, um, uh, I just give this slide and other paper from a few years ago where we tried to compare for intensive care patients acute data from 24 hours uh, in terms of predicting mortality with the disease history going uh, back 15 years. And it turned out that the disease history was more predictive than the acute data from the 24 hours. So you can actually compute the mortality score when you roll the bed into the ward um, before you have observed uh, anything. And that's, of course, also something that you could further 
improve on using uh, genetic data uh, possibly. Here's another project that we now have completed a risk prediction algorithm for in ischemic heart disease, sort of uh, time to event model. And I will skip the details because there is one take home from this project that we have taken a lot of data out of patient records um, and, and uh, used um, biochemical data, diagnosis and, and, and whatnot. Um, but we have also used polygenic uh, risk scores in, 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 uh, in this project. And it was quite interesting that adding the polygenic risk sc scores for, for 30,000 of these 40,000 uh, patients didn't add much on top of the disease history information. And people do not realize that if you have a disease trajectory, you're actually aggregating your germline risk of disease with your lifestyle somehow because it's really difficult to compete with the actual diseases a person got um, from the perspective of a genome. And, and that's why I think linking health data and, and disease trajectory data and other data types is, is actually um, playing a major role in, in, in this area. And it's not always that genetic data will add, add a, a whole lot. We don't know whether this will be similar in the other uh, projects. We had recently a, a paper published in, now I think it stopped advancing. Ah, there, in pancreatic cancer, uh, an area where we also would like to, to, to use um, uh, genetic data uh, discovered very late and so on, and, and, and we took uh, millions of, of uh, people's disease trajectories, so no genetic data here, six million people and, and, and a lot of cases. And then we replicated this in, in veterans uh, affairs data, but no genetic data. And we would like to test uh, how much can the genetic data add to, to, to this. What was quite interesting in this project, I don't want to go through all the details in it, but we, we compared Danish and US data and especially the coding practice was different. So I just skip all these details and just show you this one. So long disease trajectories from Denmark, shorter ones, half the length in, in the Veterans Administration data. But you see the darkness here, 10 times more diagnosis in the US data compared to Denmark. And people say it's because the American doctors would like to, to make money. So they give people more, more diagnosis. Um, so I was re very, really, as a machine learning person, surprised that when we uh, completed this work and did some explainability analysis of the deep learning algorithms, the features that were picked up in the Danish data, this is just the colors you need to look at. You, you, you cannot see the text. And the US data, they were largely the same, except for some opioid signal with the green here that we don't understand. Apparently, the variance administration coordinates a lot of uh, opioid uh, use and presumably a proxy for something that has a relevant with, with cancer uh, development. But that's, of course, also something we really need to consider. We would like to link data in our own country, but we will also like to compare across uh, countries. And this is, in my view, um, a success story from that perspective because data are quite diff different. The deep learning algorithm finds the same signal in the two uh, data sets. And now we will see whether we can add genetics and, 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 and uh, um, see whether that improves uh, things. So uh, the take home here from my uh, talk is that um, we really need to make sure that the infrastructures we create can take uh, not only clinical data, but also socioeconomic uh, data in, um, because uh, the um, uh, sort of um, uh, journey from, from molecular clinical, uh, molecular data, the genomic information to the disease manifestation, is, it's not something we can do bottom up. We need to go from both ends in order to 
find the molecular features that, that are important for all the comorbidities that we, 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 uh, we get here. So the situation uh, in Denmark is now that we would like to get rid of these barriers between the silos. And that's a nice development because it's, it's really hard uh, to marry a statistical organization with resources from a health ministry and, and also from other uh, ministries. But now the plan is, and it's quite far, but it hasn't uh, really been put in operation yet, is to make, and it really sounds romantic here, right? User-friendly and secure access. Um, but the important is that it will be one entrance to all this data. So that you only have to apply for access one place. And then the organizations and agencies, they will have to divide up the responsibility for approving for each other and, and making sure that they have some template projects they, they can go from, from and, and so on. So that's the ambition. And people have, of course, said immediately there will be one entrance, but will there also be one exit uh, from this kind of, of new structure? And, and that's the ambition to make sure that, that you are not just running around and are applying for access with one organization and another organization when you want to mix patient records with long-term registry data and socioeconomic data. We will see whether this model um, uh, will be realized in a way where it actually becomes more effective to link uh, all these uh, data to to uh, to genomic um, data and of course also to images and other data types but but that's at least the uh, the plan i've been participating in something called the national partnership for health data that now has held uh, six me meetings where all the heads of of agencies and so on are represented. I'm, I'm um, representing the medical faculties for, from the Danish uh, university. So, so uh, people who actually cover a lot of stakeholders uh, have, have, have uh, been meeting up here uh, and producing something that is uh, uh, trying to be a game changer. We had a meeting this morning and I didn't hear much about industry, but in, in, in Denmark, the industry is really, really, really irritated that it's so hard for them to access health data and genetic data. And there's a big push on the Danish government, also from industry, to get this fixed. And, and uh, that uh, is at least nice uh, that they are very voiced uh, around these problems. We have a small country, we are not having that much health data. If we should create some competitive advantage, it has to be uh, very fast and everybody realizes uh, that. So um, just a few acknowledgements here. Um, I got some of these slides from Bettina Lundgren, who's CEO at, at uh, the National Genome Center, and also um, Lena Sividanis, who's uh, responsible for some of the 1 million genome uh, links. But uh, that was sort of a little bit of a snapshot here. So I'll be happy to answer questions if you have some.